guys, Robin here from She's From Scratch. So today I'm gonna to be teaching you guys how to make Asiego. So Asiego is one of our favorite cheeses, um, not because of, like we love eating a ton of it, but just because it's like really good to add into things. So I use it a lot for dips, I use it a lot for just like sprinkling on top of like garlic toast or bread. Um, so it's more of our like add-in cheese. And it's also a cheese that I use when I have a lot of skimmed milk or milk that I need to skim. <laughs> practice for cheese making and this is not everybody's practice but this is my practice for cheese making is that I always use a little bit of fresh milk in every batch and the reason for this is because when I use a little bit of fresh milk in my batch it means that that cream that's in that milk hasn't cream lined yet and so once milk sits and goes through that cream line process that cream rises to the top and a reaction has occurred that no matter what you do no matter if you stir that cream back in, it's never going to be the same as it was before. It's always going to be in there more fragilely. And so cream doesn't have the casein protein in it. And so the casein protein is what reacts with your rennet and coagulates your milk when you put that rennet in there. So because the cream, the fat globules don't have that casein protein in there, they really need to get swept up in the cheese making process. They're not really part of the cheese making process. They're just kind of accidentally there and they happen to get caught in that big cluster of coagulation. So once it's risen to the top and then you stir it up and you try and put it back in there, it's just so much more fragile in there. It's already fragile to begin with and then it's just so much more. So that was a ramble, but basically my practice is that when I make cheese, I'm always using some um, fresh same day milk that hasn't cream lined yet and then I'm topping the batch up with skimmed milk that I skim and I use that cream for something else. I'm making butter today, um, so I always use that. So with Asiego, it's a cheese that I make when I have a whole bunch of cream lined milk in the fridge and I just want to um, be able to skim all the cream and make a batch of cheese. So Asiego and mozzarella are my skim milk cheeses that I make and they work really good for that. I don't mind the taste of a skim milk Asiego because I'm not sitting down to eat it with cheese and crackers. It's a cheese that I am adding into dips, like I said, or um, adding on, sprinkling on top of bread. It doesn't matter that it it doesn't have that creaminess to it. Um, so that's what I've found over the years. So I've got six gallons of skim milk here in the pot and I'm just warming it up right now to 90 degrees Fahrenheit. And so while we're waiting here for this milk to heat up, let me talk to you a little bit more about that cream process because I always get questions from people. They're like, I didn't know that. Like, am I gonna lose all my cream in my way if I use milk that has already cream lined? And so just with lifestyle, sometimes it's impossible to be using same day milk in your pot. It's just, you've got to milk in the morning, then you got to go to work and then you've got to come home and make cheese or you got to make cheese on the weekend or whatever that looks like. So sometimes it's absolutely impossible and you're not going to be able to always use fresh milk. So when I say to people, when they ask me that, I say, that's fine. Just stir it up as best as you can. And then when you do the cheese making process, be sure that you're being as gentle as possible. When you're cutting your grid, make sure you get a really good clean break before you cut. Make sure you're letting those curds rest between each grid cut so that the whole cutting process is basically taking 15 minutes, 10 minutes, um, so that those um, breaks are really healing. Making sure when you're stirring that you're not going too vigorously. Just having that in your mind that that cream is just barely holding on. It's holding on by the tips of its fingertips. And if you like bump it and jostle it around, it's just gonna get bumped out of the cheese and left in the way. So that's what I tell people when they say, I can't possibly, I can't possibly use same day milk. I can't possibly use milk that hasn't cream lined because that is just a fact of life and it shouldn't be something that stops you from making cheese. It should just be something that kind of changes your cheese making practice. And we should all be gentle. We should always be 
being as gentle as we can with our um, cheese because even milk that hasn't cream on you can jostle that cream out of there if you're being too rough but it just kind of is something to keep in the back of your mind um, and not get discouraged about because you can still make cheese you just got to do it gentler all right so we are approaching 90 degrees fahrenheit here on the thermometer so when you're making such a big batch of cheese so this is six gallons in this pot it's not it's not in a hot water bath. I guess it's playing with a microphone right now. Um, it's not in a hot water bath or anything. So the temperature in this pot, because it's such a big pot, is going to be quite varied. It says that it is 85 degrees up on top here, but it's probably 90 degrees down at the bottom or even higher. So just keeping that in mind, the pot's going to be very varied and that a lot of recipes will have you looking at getting a very specific temperature, they'll be like, get 92 degrees Fahrenheit. Well, it's nearly impossible when you are not using a hot water bath to make sure all of the milk in your pot is one temperature. Um, so I don't get so hung up on that. I'm just making sure that I'm not going too excessively high that I would be killing the bacteria. So today we are using a thermophilic bacteria. So a thermophilic is a warm, loving bacteria. This is the one that I'm using. I ordered it from Glengarry Cheese Making and I order the um the bigger dose you can get like a 10 dose or you can get no wait, you can get a one dose or you can get a 10 dose so i ordered the 10 dose um so i don't make a ton of thermophilic cheeses and you kind of want to think about when you order a culture if you are going to be using um, this culture a lot so i make a lot of mesophilic cheeses like cheddars and goudas and colby's those are the lower temperature cheeses so to order a big bottle of this, maybe not, maybe not what you're going to need to do. Um, but it's just kind of thinking about what cheeses you are going to want to make. And I should really make a culture video so you guys know what I'm talking about. But anyways, I'm going to add this in. I'm going to add in three quarters of a teaspoon of this thermophilic um, culture. And so I'm going to turn off the heat here, stir it up a little bit. And it's always okay if you go a couple degrees over because this milk is going to be sitting for a while you want it to be staying at that temperature so if you go a couple degrees over um, it's going to drop in temperature as it sits and ripens so that's not going to be the end of the world either so three quarters of a teaspoon of this thermophilic culture is going in and i do talk about cultures in my homestead cheese making 101 course um, so I actually take you guys shopping and I take you to um, some of the most popular um, some of the most popular cheese making supplies websites and I show you how I would buy culture um, so that you're not getting so confused because it is super confusing. I was actually talking um, with the Zoom group yesterday and we were talking about how confusing it is when you go onto a cheese supply website and there's just like pages and pages and pages of culture and I don't get all hung up on a bunch of cultures. I have, I own two cultures, two lactobacteria cultures. I'll keep some mold cultures and stuff for other cheeses, but, um, and then I just say that two is good enough and I make cheese with those two and I make all sorts of cheese. So just not getting too hung up on it, um, because it is easy to get super confused about it. So what I just did there was sprinkle the culture over top of, um, my milk. And so what you have to do now is let it rehydrate because it is a freeze dried culture. The better you sprinkle it, the more evenly you sprinkle it, the less time you're going to have to wait. So usually a recipe will say wait five minutes for it to rehydrate. The way that you know that it's rehydrated is if you have little oil stains on there. So I'm not sure if you can see that. There's basically little oil stains on there and that means that that culture has rehydrated or is rehydrating. I'm going to wait a few minutes, give it a few minutes to kind of make sure that all of those little bits are rehydrating. Um, if you're not so evenly handed, which I always do, you'll have like little clumps of culture. And those little clumps of culture, even after you wait five minutes, you're gonna come back and the outsides of them will be rehydrated, but the insides won't. It's not a big deal, just stir it in. Um, and that is what we're doing right now, is waiting five minutes for this to rehydrate. All right, so I've given it a few minutes. It's rehydrated. I've got that oily kind of skin on there <clears throat> or oily kind of, not a skin, oil. it just looks like if I put olive oil in there. Um, I just, I really don't think you guys can see it as well as I'm describing. 
But anyways, so you can tell that it's rehydrated because it doesn't look like powder anymore. So now I'm going to stir this in. So when I stir a culture into the milk, I want to be as gentle as possible because I don't want to introduce a bunch of air into that milk. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to do an up and down motion. And so you'll find that you're kind of making little tornadoes basically in the milk. You're making little tornadoes and drawing that culture down into the milk. And you do want to draw it quite well. You want it to be dispersed throughout the pot. You don't want to be leaving culture at the surface. So as much as it's important to not add a bunch of air in, that's a little bit of a finicky thing. The biggest thing is getting your milk completely covered with the bacteria, basically. So I try not to break the surface when I do this stirring. I try to just make little tornadoes and draw it down with the tornadoes, but don't get hung up on that. Just biggest thing again, just make sure you are getting that culture dispersed right to the bottom. And make sure you turn the burner off right here because a lot of times I will kind of get distracted. I should make sure it's off right now. It is off. Um, I will kind of get distracted and then I'll leave the burner on. And that's like a common mistake that I do all the time and I think a lot of other people do too. So always making, doing a burner check here and making sure the burner's off. So what we're gonna do now, this is dispersed throughout the pot. I'm gonna take out my thermometer, take out my spoon, all this jazz, and I'm gonna cover the pot and let this ripen for 40 minutes. So I set a timer because I'm gonna get busy doing other things and I'm gonna forget to come back. So I set a timer on the stove and then come back in 40 minutes. since my milk has been ripening and so now I'm going to add my rennet. So you don't want to mix your rennet up until right before you need it. The longer it's sitting in this water, the less well it's going to work. Um, so I'm using double strength calf rennet today. So I've got one teaspoon diluted in lukewarm water. I've taken my lid off my pot and now before I add in this rennet, I've got a little bit of a cream line on top of my milk here. So I'm just going to add that back in. Just make sure that it's all incorporated the best I can and that's going to help me at the end to be able to save as much of that cream into the milk as I can. Just like I was talking about before, it very gently needs to get swept up in the cheese making process. Even though there's not a lot of cream in here, um, when you skim milk by hand, you're always going to have some cream left in here. So, so I'm going to add this rennet in there and then same thing, you want to draw it down straight to the bottom of the pot. And if you're doing it properly, unlike how I just did, you want to make sure that you're not adding a ton of air into there. So little tornadoes all the way to the pot, bottom of the pot. But again, the most important thing is that you are dispersing it throughout. So now I'm going to put the lid back on and wait another 40 minutes. So if your pot had cooled down significantly in that 40 minutes of ripening time, before you added the rennet, you could have heated up your pot a little bit. And so this is going to be, if you're making cheese in, say, the dead of winter and it's super cold in your house, maybe you're going to have to do that. Whereas if you're making cheese in the summer, maybe you're not going to have to do that. So I kind of just use my cheese making practice about what temperature in my house is because we all live in, well, maybe not all of us, but we live in old farmhouses as homestead cheese makers typically. And our temperature of our house is not always constant. So um, today I don't need to heat up that milk before adding the rennet, but some days I do. So 40 minutes in the pot. has been um, about 40 minutes, so I'm coming back now um, since I added my rennet, so I'm coming back now to come um, and check what my break looks like. So, let's take a peek here. All right, so when I check for a clean break, I always go kind of down at an angle like this, go down underneath the milk, 
with my blade and then I lift up blade side and check for a break. And if it's nice and clean, nothing's falling off, um, there's no little pieces everywhere, then I know that's that, that's a clean, clean break and I can go on to my cutting stage. All right, so if, unlike other cheeses that you may have made where you cut a grid with a knife, Osiego is the type of cheese that you actually get to use a whisk to cut the curds. So that makes it a lot easier to get even sized curds, but it also adds a different element of that be gentle, where you do have a risk of losing the cream into your way because it's more of a rougher way to cut than having just basically cutting a grid and being able to let them heal. So the really important part when you are using a whisk is to make sure that you are letting them do that heal time after your five minutes of, um, uh, or after your cutting, sorry. So making sure that you are doing that heal time after your cutting. So when I use a whisk to cut, I am going to try and manipulate the least possible that I can to again, not lose all of that cream in my way keep as much fat as I can in there. So I go straight up and down and I put it down into the pot all the way. As far as it will go, it hits the bottom there and I'm pulling straight up. And then I'm going to a new spot, straight down and up. I'm never going over a spot that I just was. And I do this through the whole pot, up and down up and down, never going over a spot. And so this is gonna give me really even curds um, that are an even size. It's also going to give me curds that um, are going to be able to heal better. They won't have kind of turned into a bunch of whiskey mess. minutes, even 10 minutes if you need to, to let these curves really have a chance to heal so that I'm not coming back and they're just kind of just smushing and not becoming good form curds because I want them to become good form curds and you'll see what I mean by that um, in this next section of the video where I start stirring. All right, so it's been about five minutes since I cut my curds. So one thing that you do want to remember when you um, are letting your curds heal is that you don't want to leave them so long that they're going to the bottom of the pot and just all matting together again. So five minutes, come back and check if they're still just like really fragile and breaking apart. Um, one, maybe that meant you didn't have quite a clean enough break um, before you cut them, which is fine, but just give them another five minutes to heal um, and then head on in. So I am at five minutes, I am confident that, sorry, at five minutes, I am confident that we are ready to go here. So I'm going to turn my burner on to like lowish. And so the uh, temperature in my pot right now, it had started at 90, but obviously it's cooled down over this last hour and a half or so. Um, so I'm just going to slowly warm it up to about 115 degrees Fahrenheit, but I want it to take about 40 minutes to do that. And then entire time I'm going to be stirring constantly. And so this is a huge thing for cheese making where people are like, do I really have to stir constantly? And yes, you do have to stir constantly if you want to get a specific result. If you get pulled away from the pot for five minutes or so, it's not going to be the end of the world, but you do kind of just need to know that the stir stirring part where you're stirring constantly is quite an important part because this is a part of your cheese making where you are allowing the moisture to be pushed out of your curds for one as they cook down that moisture is getting pushed out of the curds and then two it is um, actually affecting the acidity of how or how that milk is acidifying, how that cheese is acidifying. So you've got that lactic bacteria in there and that lactic bacteria is feeding on the lactose in the milk and it is um, acidifying your milk. So the measurement of acidity 
even though I don't measure acidity in my milk, the measurement of acidity or the idea that your milk is acidifying is the idea that that bacteria is actually working in your milk, that it's feeding on the lactose and that thus it's multiplying. The more it feeds, the more bacteria there is and the different acidity your milk is. So that's why, that's my little ramble on why it's really important to actually stir your curds during that time. And I always say that different milk can react differently. So different seasons of times, I will have milk that is going to turn into curds or into the type of curds that I want for end stage for this cheese much quicker than other times. So really focusing on what the curd actually looks like at the end is really important. But also just having a time frame is important for when you're heating because you don't want to be heating too quickly. Um, but again, you don't want to be heating too slowly. So did I confuse you there? Probably. Anyways, you can see here, I've got mostly um, good size curds or like normal size curds, but I do have a few chunks of curds. And so this is where your hands come in super handy because your hands are basically a whisk. And so when you break up these curds, you don't want to be like crushing them because if you crush them, you can see there's little tiny pieces here. I don't know if you can see that little tiny pieces of curd. And so when curds get crushed, that happens, they break up and then you lose that yield in your milk. So being really gentle here and kind of using your fingers as just a whisk to kind of break up those pieces and put them to the size that you want them to be. So anytime that you are heating curds and stirring at the same time is really important to make sure you're going down and doing a sweep of the bottom every once in a while because we're not using a hot water bath and a lot of um, people do use hot water baths but because this is a giant pot and you'd have to have another giant pot for a hot water bath. Um, anyways, you have to be really careful that you don't scald milk on the bottom of your pot. So if you do scald milk, because it happens, sometimes you will just like get pulled away to run and do a diaper change and then you gotta come back and <laughs> wash your hands and then <laughs> continue on. Anyways, so always, if you get pulled away, turn the burner off first off, but sometimes you won't remember that. So if you do get scalded bits on the bottom, just pull those scalded bits out. So they will all kind of glom together and take those out, eat them fresh, do whatever you want, feed them to your dog, but don't leave them in with your cheese because that will affect the texture of your cheese. If you did leave them in, it's not the end of the world, but um, just a little, little pro hack for you. So it's also super important to be sure that you are heating your milk really slowly. You don't want to be heating it too quickly. And like I said, I'm trying to go from 90 degrees to 115 degrees over 40 minutes. So that slow heating is going to really help me to be able to release the right amount of moisture out of my curds. Um, it's going to really help me to be able to control the acidity of my curds um, and how quickly they acidify. And yeah. so if you heated your milk too quickly and it's still early on, you might have curds that are still this size and are um, end goal is to have curds that are pea sized. So if you had curds that are still like this and you heat it too quickly, the outsides of these curds are going to harden because that's what happens when these curds start to get um, cooked. And so then a bunch of moisture gets locked inside those curds and that's going to cause you to have mechanical holes in your cheese, which aren't the end of the world. Um, it's going to cause you to have a bit of a different texture because now you've got this piece that has a big hard miss on it because it kind of got yeah it's just gonna it's not good don't do it do your best to heat it as slowly as you can make it last that 40 minutes but also pay attention to how your curds are feeling so as i approach closer to my time where i expect that i'm going to be done what i'm looking for is signs that my curds are starting to be ready so i saw some large ones in there that's just gonna be what it is that's just my cheese making technique I didn't it very good. but they're not the end of the world so i'm looking for the types of curds that are the most common in the pot so these that size there oops so most of the curds in the pot are about this size i would say that's about the size of maybe a navy bean 
when I push them between my fingers, right now, if I push through, it just kind of breaks through. It does have some firmness on it, but it's not anything significant yet. So they're still quite soft. Still got time to go. The next thing that I'm looking for as I approach my time is how nicely they sit together. So when I take a handful, do they stick together? And they do stick quite nicely together. So I'm getting closer. I can see that I am. I just need a little bit more time. I need to get a little bit more springiness on those curds. But when I close them together, see, they could, they could stick a little better. So when you have a big pot like this, and you are stirring for a long time and you've got your hand in there. What's more accurate to me than actually using the temperature is feeling what the temperature feels like because 120 is going to be where it starts to hurt. So when I know that I'm getting close to that 115, I can feel that it's getting warmer. Um, it's five degrees from away from it actually hurting. So that is more accurate to me than having a thermometer in the top few inches of your way where that way on the top is going to be cooler because it's getting aerated every second here as I stir. So that stuff closer to the bottom, that's where my fingertips, they are really telling me what the temperature in my pot is. So like my thermometer right now, it doesn't say it's that hot in here, but I can tell that I am approaching that 115 degrees through the what is happening at the bottom of my pot. And so that just tells you how much variation you have in a pot. So it does say it's only 90 degrees at the top. And I think my thermometer is broken because I'm sure it's, no, it only feels like 90 degrees at the top. And so that's crazy, right? That you could have almost a 15 degree difference in one pot. So that's where I'm like, don't get so focused on the temperature, get more focused on what's happening with the curds because you are gonna have such a variation. And as long as you're going, not going like significantly higher, where if you were just paying attention to that thermometer, you might be going significantly higher at the bottom. So let's do a curd test here. So my curds are starting to be about this size. So this is like, what could I describe this as? It's like a, it's like a pea. So they're starting to be about pea size. When I squish them between my finger, they are having some more firmness. They're not like gum yet, but they're having some more firmness than they did before. They're not breaking through. They're more just kind of like squishing but still breaking through a little bit. If it was like gum consistent, consistency, they would just always flatten and you'd have to put a lot of pressure on to um, actually break through. But these ones, just a moderate amount of pressure. Let me get one. Just a moderate amount of pressure, it flattens them. Severe pressure goes like that. So the next good thing about testing if they're ready is when you take a handful, do they clump together? And these clump together really nicely. So these curds are ready. I'm at 40 minutes of stirring. I'm, it says that I'm at 95 degrees at the top of my pot, but I can feel the bottom is 115. So I am ready to go on to my next stage. So my next stage in this cheese making is that I'm going to turn off my heat and I'm going to do a holding period. So a holding period is where you leave your curds underneath the way just to continue to acidify to kind of clump together and I'm going to leave them in that holding period for 20 minutes. So one thing that you do want to be conscientious about when you go through this holding period is that your burner's not still too hot because if it is still too hot you're going to want to move this pot right off the burner. Um, I'm not worried it's not too hot so I'm just going to leave it. I'm just doing a few more stirs just to cool it down there. And then I'm gonna put the lid on this pot because I wanna maintain that temperature at 115.
You got your cheese form. Then you got your cheese cloth. Now you're gonna break off chunks of your cheese like this. It's okay, guys. You wanna break off chunks. Try not to break them up into little pieces, but break off chunks and pack these chunks into your cheese form. significantly pack them in there you want to go around the edges and pull up your cheesecloth and this is going to keep you from having any crinkles on the sides if a few get in there you're going to deal with that later so it's not a big deal you want to take one edge the longest edge you've got and fold it over the top just flat like this snugly and then you're going to put your top on and now you're going to put this in the cheese press at medium pressure wrapping here so this is a couple days after actually quite a while after i filmed the um the asiago video i'm actually still wearing the same shirt i have changed in the time since then although you can't really tell from the stains anyways mom life hashtag mom love life anyways um so i want to come on here and talk to you guys about the pressing stage because i didn't really film that i kind of got i filmed the video you can see that i was doing a bunch of things while i was filming the video and then i had to run out and um, check some cows and stuff and then i kind of just did a mic drop and didn't film anymore so i am going to come on here and just talk to you guys about how i press an oz Diego, um, what i do after the pressing what I do until I get it into the cave. So first thing is I put it in the press. I said I put it under medium pressure. So for me, medium pressure, I don't like measure amounts of pressure or anything like that. What I do is I just know my press enough that I know that two jugs at this section is medium pressure, two jugs at this section is high pressure. So that's just coming over like years of experience. In my course, I do go into like how to actually calculate pressure, but I'm not gonna get so deep into that here because I just don't think it's that important. I think that when you are pressing a cheese to gauge pressure, the most important thing that you can do is actually look at your cheese and see what it's doing. If it's not pressing, then you're not putting enough pressure on. If it's having like milky whey leak out of it, then you're putting too much pressure on. So kind of just looking at your cheese and troubleshooting from there is going to help you a whole lot more than me just telling you go and do this math calculation and it's you get this crazy number and you're like how did I even do that what do I do and it just gets to be so confusing so what I say is use your common sense because back in the day when homesteaders were just making their cheese in their kitchens like pressing their cheese with rocks, they were not calculating the radius of a circle to be able to press their cheese. So again, a ramble, but I do talk about how to properly do it in the course. So if you want to um, learn how to properly do it, that is where you can learn. So for here, I'm saying put it in under medium pressure. So when you pull it out after half an hour, because you're going to press it for half an hour, and then you're going to pull it out, you're going to flip it over um, or pull it out, put your She's caught down, flip it over, and then put it back in the form. So when you do that, after 30 minutes, you want to be looking at your cheese and you want all your curds to be knit together. It will be still a very soft cheese, but no curds should be falling off. If curds are falling off at this point, then you need to significantly increase your pressure. So you put it back in the press after you redress it. Do exactly how I did before. Um, fold the the cheesecloth over the top make sure there's no wrinkles put it in the cheese press and then you're going to press it for another half an hour and so this can be a half an hour to an hour whatever you kind of want to do but it's really important to come back and do these redressing parts because 
thermophilic cheeses because they're so warm oftentimes you'll have them stick to the cheesecloth and that is such a pain so making sure you're coming back at least once to redress if not twice and then during that second time when you're coming back to redress that's also a really great time to look at your pressure how is it pressing how much more do you need to increase um, to be able to um, make the best cheese possible and to work with whatever type of press that you are using and then finally, you're going to press it for eight hours after that last redressing. So put it in your press, press it for eight hours at high pressure. Again, you don't wanna be seeing like a milky type whey coming out. You just want regular clearish whey coming out. Um, milky whey means that you're pressing it too hard and that fat is actually being pushed out of your cheese. And you wanna save as much of that fat as you can. Even though this is a skim milk cheese, you wanna save as much of that fat as you can. Um, so that is what you're going to do. And then after eight hours, you're going to pull it out of the press and you're going to put it in 18 to 20% brine. And so to prepare an 18 to 20% brine, I say 20% because that's just easier math for me. So fine ground salt and water weigh the exact same thing. Like pretty much, pretty much the exact same thing. So I say use one cup of fine ground salt to five cups of water and that will give you a 20% brine. So if you're gonna need to double that, you and then you would do two cups. What you doing, Gus? Careful. Then you would do two cups of fine ground salt to 10 cups of water. And that is gonna give you your 20% brine. And this is a brine that you keep in the fridge and it can last for so, like it can last for so long. You can keep using it for cheeses and cheeses and cheeses. You are going to need to add back salt into it. And I've got some tricks on Instagram of how to know um, how much salt to add back in. But for now, um, just know that this is a brine that you can keep as long as you take care of it, you can keep it for a long time. So a lot of people are like, that's a lot of salt. Like, I don't want to waste that much salt. You're not wasting it. You are able to um, use it over and over again. So you are going to take your cheese out of the press and you are going to put it directly into this brine. You want to brine it for three hours per pound of cheese. So weigh that cheese and put it in the brine for three hours per pound of cheese. So you're gonna to wanna to come back if it's, cause it's gonna float. You're gonna to wanna to come back halfway through that time and flip it over so that that bottom edge is going to get, um, get salted as well. If it's gonna be like the middle of the night, which it probably is if you made cheese in the morning and now you're putting your cheese in the brine for the night, what I do is I sprinkle the top of the cheese with salt so that it doesn't matter that I'm not coming back. So that's a little life hack for you there full of them in this video. I tell you, you just came here for Asiago and I'm just like rambling on about everything. I'm going to do that for three hours per pound of cheese. So if your cheese weighs, say, let me do some easy math. Say your cheese weighs three pounds. You're going to do it for nine hours. Say your cheese weighs five pounds. You are going to do it for, it's not that hard, Robin, 15 hours. So that is how you're going to know how long to brown your cheese. So once you take it, once you brine it and you take it out of the brine, you, you've done your time in there, you're going to put on a rack and you want to dry it for a couple days or until it is as dry as slightly drier than a clammy handshake. And that's like a, a weird, a weird way to tell you that your cheese is dry enough. So when you touch it, it shouldn't be moist. If you're going to put a paper towel on it, the paper towel shouldn't come away wet. So that is how you know that it is dry enough. So that could take one day, that could take two days, that could take three days. It depends how well you did that, that pressing stage. And so this is a really great time to be able to evaluate your pressing and be like, well, it's taking me five days to dry this cheese. Maybe I didn't do this quite right. And it's not the end of the world. It's just good knowledge for future. The next time you make Aussie I go, you know, I need to up that pressure a little bit because there was too much moisture still in this cheese. Okay. And then once your cheese is dry, you are going to vacuum seal it. So vacuum seal it, make sure you label it with the, the day you made it, the amount of salt you use, whatever you want to put on there. And then I just use a regular refrigerator to age my cheese. I have it turned to the warmest setting because I make a lot of cheese. So I have this entire refrigerator filled with cheese. So I put it in that refrigerator and I do not touch it for the next mm, three months, three months, six months. That's when Asiago is starting to be really good. Um, so I'm going to check on that cheese in three months and maybe I'll even do a video on it when I check it on, check on it. But anyways, so today, 
I did another ramble for you guys, but taught you how to make Asiago cheese. I hope that you guys enjoyed this video. I hope that it taught you tons of things. If you love this video and you want to have more videos, comment below. Tell me what kind of videos you want to see because I make so many much cheese here on my homestead and I love teaching other homesteaders how to make cheese. Um, so subscribe to my channel. Tell me what you want to see and I will make content for you because that is what I'm all about is teaching homesteaders how to turn their milk into cheese and how to make cheesy making not so confusing and hard and seem like it's impossible. So I love you guys and I really want to be able to create content for you.